True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm your host, Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 23, The Murder of Tanya Flowerday. Before we get into today's episode, I wanted to let you know about a podcast that I recently did a voiceover piece for. The show is called Dream Detective, and it's a dream interpretation and guidance podcast. I definitely think you should check it out, and I'll leave a link to the episode in the show notes. I don't have any new Patreon announcements to make this week, and I have no doubt that this is in no small part due to the economic downturn from the coronavirus pandemic. I fully understand the fear and concern that our listeners worldwide have for their own financial future. And I just want to put it out there that if you are a current Patreon subscriber and you need to reduce or discontinue your support for the next few months, I completely understand. I will continue to put out the content that will hopefully distract us from our current realities a bit and give those in quarantine something to listen to. Today's case was requested by Paula Grubin, and I actually hadn't heard about it until she mentioned it on our Facebook page. Thank you for the suggestion, Paula. For this case, I primarily used internet article resources, as well as a YouTube video by true crime YouTuber Joshua Miles, and I'll link that video in the show notes as well. Today's case reminded me a lot of the Tracy Thompson case that I covered in episode 10. But the Flower Day family would get justice. Of a sort. And I say that because their daughter's murderer was caught and convicted. But whether that was really justice or not remains to be seen. There are still questions about what really happened to Tanya Flower Day. And those questions relate to the seedy underworld of drug dealers and, unbelievably enough, snuff films. And as most of these cases do, even after a sentence is passed, decades later, the ripples continue to knock up against the lives of those who love Tanya, reminding them that there are still too many things we don't know. So without further ado, let's get into episode 23, The Murder of Tanya Flowerday. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Tanya Kelly Flowerday was born on the 7th of November 1984 to Bob and Dolores Flowerday. She would be their only child, and it's plain to see from photographs that the three were a tight-knit family. Tanya comes across as a sweet, confident girl. Despite being very young in the photographs, she looks like she was really comfortable in her own skin. She also very clearly deeply impacted the lives of her friends, as even to this day, they commemorate her birthday and talk about how much they miss her on social media. Tanya's dad, Bob, owned a few takeaway franchises, and his plan was to train his daughter to one day take over management of a new store he planned to open. So when Tanya matriculated, She went straight to working in the business and training for her future. Sadly, this would be a future that would never materialize. On Friday the 13th of June, 2003, Tanya was 18 years old and had matriculated just six months before. She found out that a few of her friends who were in a band were going to be playing a gig at a club and pub called Julian's Bistro in Blackheath, Johannesburg. From my Google searches, 
it appears that this establishment no longer exists. But it was about 200 meters from Cresta Shopping Center and the suburb of Blackheath, borders suburbs like Rainburg, Cresta, and Northcliffe. Tanya didn't have her driver's license yet, so she relied on her dad for transport, and he had no problem dropping her off and picking her up, as long as he knew that she was safe. Tanya asked her dad to drop her off at Julian's Bistro that night, and he agreed. They decided that she would phone him as soon as she was ready to come home. Tanya left her home in London that night, with a jacket. It was winter in Johannesburg, which gets rather chilly. Her cell phone and her ID book, which she needed to get into the club and to buy alcohol. Eyewitnesses and Tanya's friends confirmed that she did arrive at the club that night. Bob Flowerday, however, never got a phone call to collect his daughter. By Saturday morning, Bob and Dolores were concerned. Tanya had not called, and she hadn't come home. Her phone was switched off. This was very unlike her, as, despite her age, her parents say that she was extremely responsible and would never go anywhere without telling them where she was. By the time Tanya's shift at the takeaway business came round that afternoon, she had still not arrived at work, and the Flower Days knew something was very wrong. On Saturday afternoon, Bob Flower Day went to Linden Police Station to report his daughter as missing. Sadly, he was told that he had to wait until she'd been missing for 24 hours to file a report. Why any police officer would tell him this, I don't know but I can only assume that perhaps because she was a 18-year-old girl who had gone missing on a night out, they assumed that there was a good chance she was still out partying somewhere. Let's be clear here. There is no waiting period to report a missing person in South Africa. Bob, unfortunately, knew no difference at the time, and he went home. On Sunday, when Tanya had still not returned, Bob went back to Linden Police Station to be told that they didn't have the forms required to fill in a missing persons report, so he would have to go to Fairlands Police Station, which is seven kilometres away. Bob did so, but when he arrived at Fairlands Police Station, he was told that he would need a photograph to report Tanya missing. Bob went home, got an ID photograph of Tanya, and went back to the police station. He was then told that the photograph had to be full length. Having gone back home to retrieve a second photograph, Bob would eventually be allowed to fill in a missing persons report for his 18-year-old daughter on Sunday, the 15th of June. The following day, the Flower Days were grateful when a man who said that he was the investigating officer on Tanya's case arrived at their home. They were less pleased when he refused to listen to anything that they were saying about Tanya's disappearance, and after searching her room, told her parents that he believed that she was on a drug binge somewhere and would return home when she was ready. Tanya Flowerday was staunchly against drugs. She had never taken drugs, and her friend said that if there were drugs at a party, she would be sure to leave. The investigating officer insisted that she was definitely involved in drugs, though. While he'd been searching Tanya's room, Dolores had found something in the postbox. It was Tanya's ID book. The ID book she had with her when she disappeared. Dolores brought it inside and handed it to the police officer. He showed absolutely no interest in it. Despite the fact that it was a clear piece of evidence, and could have had the fingerprints of someone who was involved in Tanya's disappearance on it, he grabbed it with his bare hands, paged through it, and then tossed it onto a nearby table. He left the Flower Day residence shortly afterwards. By Tuesday afternoon, when Tanya had been missing for four days, Bob had heard nothing more from the officer that had been at his house, so he called the Fairlands police station to speak to him. 
None of the staff members at Fairland's police station had ever heard of the person he was referring to, and they told him to phone Linden Police Station instead. Bob did exactly this, and it was eventually determined between the two police stations that the man who'd visited the Flower Day house was not a police officer. He was a reservist. A police reservist is a member of the public who volunteers their time to the police to carry out tasks as assigned without payment. Reservists will never be asked to investigate cases. How this man came to be in possession of Tanya's case file is unknown, and we can only hope that appropriate action was taken against him. By Wednesday, it had become clear that neither Linden nor Fairland's police station had done anything about Tanya's case. If this has echoes of Tracy Thompson's case for you, I can assure you that it felt the same for me. But then I came across some figures, and things started to make a little more sense. In 2003, at Fairland's police station, they had 36 investigating officers working cases. 60% of those officers were booked off due to work stress. At the time that Tanya went missing, Fairland's police station had 2,222 open cases to investigate. If only 15 of their investigating officers were working, that means each officer had 148 cases to investigate. Oh, and they only had three working vehicles between them. I'm guessing that Linden Police Station was not in a much better position either. Now let's be clear here. There is no excuse for the ineptitude that the Flower Days had to endure. And trust me, it will get worse before it gets better. But I think it's important to distinguish between the responsibility for this severe lack of resources. There is no way on earth that a single investigating officer can effectively investigate 148 cases on his or her own without a vehicle. It's just not possible. So Tanya and her parents were let down by the system. But I don't think we can single out a police officer and put the blame on them. Sadly, as I mentioned, it would get worse. When Bob Flowerday, five days after his daughter had gone missing, realised that absolutely nothing had been done about her case, and witnessed the complete lack of resources that his local police station was dealing with, he understandably lost his cool, and he was contacted by the commander of Linden Police Station, who suggested that they go to the morgue. I have no doubts that this is the last thing the Flower Days wanted to be doing, and also think that this could have been handled better, but they agreed. They needed answers. When the Flower Days arrived at the morgue, they were shown to the body of an unidentified young woman. The body was naked, not covered in a sheet, and the trolley on which she lay was covered in blood. It was Tanya. Their 18-year-old daughter had been beaten so badly that she was almost unrecognisable. She had laid in the morgue for five days, having been found the Saturday after she disappeared. While Bob and Dolores had been fighting with two police stations to simply fill in a missing persons report, their daughter had already been found. It would later be determined that a resident of a house in Durham Street, Darrenwood, had woken to see what she thought was a doll sitting propped up against her garden wall. She would say that she'd heard voices in the early hours of Saturday morning, but she then heard a car door slam shut and the car sped away, and she thought that it had been some drunk people that had stopped at the wrong house. When she emerged from her house in the light of day and saw what she thought was a doll, she very quickly realised that it was actually the dead body of a young girl. 
Durham Road is 1.2 kilometers as the crow flies from Julian's Bistro. It is a residential road, and it's not a road that you would drive down unless you had business there. Whoever dumped Tanya's body at that house had specifically driven down that road because it didn't get a lot of traffic and there was probably less chance she'd be found quickly. While reeling from the shock of finding their daughter in the morgue, the flower days were given a plastic bag by morgue staff. It contained the clothes that Tanya had been wearing that night. They were told to take it home with them. After two days of having to look at her child's clothing, drenched in blood, Dolores decided to wash them. Later that same day, the investigating officer on Tanya's case phoned asking for the clothes. They had been given to the family in error. The mortuary staff would claim that they didn't know it was a murder case. Sadly, through no fault of the flower days, as they knew no better, clothing which could have contained a huge amount of evidence had been washed. The only item that had been retained at the mortuary was Tanya's torn underwear, which had been taken as part of a sexual assault kit. Tanya, it emerged, had not just been viciously beaten, she had been equally viciously raped. The pathologist who would do Tanya's autopsy would later say that her injuries were so severe that she looked like someone who'd been in a car accident. She had been beaten while naked with a blunt instrument, raped both vaginally and anally, to the extent that there were physical injuries to her genitals, and then strangled to death. Her killer had then redressed her and dumped her body. For a month, the investigation into Tanya's murder floundered, until one day, Bob came into the London police station to get an update, and very loudly lost his cool with the commander. A young inspector overheard the father's desperate pleas for assistance, and after Bob had left, Christal Steinhuebel approached her commander and asked for permission to work on Tanya's case. He agreed, and Steinhuebel would soon introduce herself to the Flower Days as the new investigating officer on Tanya's case. Within days, Steinhuebel had made progress. She checked Tanya's call records and found that at 1am on Saturday, she had phoned a specific cell phone number several times. At 1.20am, she'd sent a light-hearted and upbeat message to a friend. And within 40 minutes, at 2am, her SIM card was removed from her cell phone and replaced with someone else's. This was clearly not done by Tanya, and it indicates that by this time, she was either already dead or completely incapacitated. Tanya's friends from the club confirmed that they had seen a man that they didn't know meeting her inside the club in the early hours of Saturday morning. Shortly afterwards, she left with the man. Steinhuebel identified a police informant who she believed could have information about Tanya's murder and arranged to interview him. The man produced a name, Ronald Grimsley. Steinhuebel looked into Grimsley's background. Ronald Grimsley was 25 years old. He worked for a film production company and helped to film and produce television adverts. He was also a heroin addict. He'd been to rehab five times in the last few years, and each time he'd relapsed. When the flower days were shown a photograph of Ronald, Bob said he knew the man. Tanya had introduced him to her parents just days before her death. She'd allegedly known Grimsley for two weeks. In a stroke of luck, Steinhuebel realised that there was an open warrant of arrest out for Grimsley for fraud, 
and within hours, he had been arrested. The fraud arrest was, of course, used to interrogate Grimsley about Tanya's murder. He proceeded to confess, both to Stainwebel and then in the presence of a magistrate, to having killed Tanya Flauder. He also pointed out the spot where Tanya's body had been dumped. With his confession and the pointing out, he was returned to the holding cells while the police formulated murder and rape charges against him. While Grimsley was in the holding cells overnight, he attempted suicide by cutting his wrists with a blade and hanging himself with a bedsheet. He was discovered and rushed to hospital, where he was declared brain dead and went into a coma. Steinhobel discovered that Grimsley had left a suicide note. A portion of that note would eventually be released to the public and read as follows. Quote, Please, Mom, forgive me. I won't lie anymore, not to you or to myself, for what happened on the 13th of June 2003 cannot be changed. You are maybe asking yourselves the question why I've done what I've done. There is only one thing I can think of, and that's to make the pain I'm causing our family to end. A lot of questions will go unanswered, but know that with all my heart, I'm sorry for it all. That young lady had her whole life ahead of her, but it was ended before her time, and her parents don't have much else to live for. She was the only child and what has happened is unforgivable, at least in my eyes. To Mr. and Mrs. Flowerday, all I can say is Lord have mercy on my soul. You have been robbed of all of your joy and happiness. I cannot even begin to understand the pain and sorrow that has been forced onto your lives. I'm really sorry about what happened. Please try to forgive me. I want you to know that I've used drugs for the past nine years. The only way to support my addiction is through stealing, lying, and scheming. And this is where I've ended up. End quote. Ronald Grimsley lay in a coma for two months, and then he woke up. Very soon after regaining consciousness, Grimsley contacted Inspector Christel Steinwebel. There was more information that he wanted to give her about Tanya's death, he said, and what he would soon allege would take the investigation in a completely new direction. Ronald Grimsley told Inspector Steinwebel that he had not been the only one involved in Tanya's death. He claimed that he had owed two drug dealers a huge amount of money, and the men had suggested that the only way to pay off the debt would be to bring them Tanya. He claimed that when Tanya had called him in the early hours of Saturday the 14th of June, she'd wanted a lift home. Why Tanya would have done this remains a mystery, as she could have called her father, but perhaps she didn't want to bother him at that early hour and instead tried to make her own way home. Grimsley said that instead of taking Tanya home, he'd taken her to a house in Fontainebleau, Randburg. The house, for all intents and purposes, was abandoned and condemned, but it was used as a drug haven by the two men he owed money to. He went on to say that when they arrived at the house, he'd set up camera equipment and then raped Tanya on camera. Afterwards, The two drug dealers, who he claimed were Nigerian citizens, had also raped Tanya. They'd then beaten and strangled her while filming the entire horrific event. In essence, Grimsley claimed that at the drug dealer's direction, he had made a snuff film. A snuff film is essentially a form of pornography in which one of the participants is killed 
after being sexually assaulted and while being filmed. The existence of snuff films has been portrayed as both an urban legend and nothing more than fiction, and on the other hand, their existence has thought to be absolutely real and a common occurrence on the dark web. Gerard Lapaskachny would say that, to his knowledge, police had never found evidence of snuff movies in South Africa, but that he had seen recorded sexual assaults, and in his opinion, it wouldn't be too far of a stretch to assume that someone had filmed a murder too. Violent pornography exists, and there are many people who enjoy watching sadomasochistic sexual acts. Violent offenders are also often found to enjoy documenting their crimes, so it's not that difficult to believe that it's happened in South Africa. There is a difference, though, between believing that violent offenders would be capable of filming their acts and believing that there is actually an industry for the production and distribution of these types of films. Again, considering the type of networks that have recently been uncovered distributing child abuse material on the dark web, it's not a stretch to believe that this could be the case with snuff films too. Whether or not we believe this to be happening in South Africa is perhaps not the point here. Ronald Grimsley was saying that there was video evidence of Tanya's murder, and that there were, at a minimum, two other people on the loose who were responsible for her rape and murder. Grimsley had claimed that the tape of Tanya's murder was intended for sale outside of South Africa. Frighteningly, something that emerged from this case was that South Africa at the time did not have a law that made it illegal to import or export snuff films from or to other countries. It was illegal to produce and distribute such material within South Africa, but that same law would strangely not cover material from other countries. Grimsley's new allegations almost confirmed something that the police had believed all along. There had been doubts as to whether one person could really have caused the damage that was done to Tanya's body. Now Inspector Stainwobble had to find these two men. Following up on information that Grimsley had given her, a flat in Hillbrow was soon raided, and a Nigerian citizen was taken into custody, on drug charges. Tanya's parents were advised of the arrest, and they were told that the man's hard drive, as well as several video cassette tapes, had been seized and would be looked at. No evidence of the man's involvement with Tanya's murder could be found, and no footage of her murder would ever be recovered. Very soon after the Nigerian man's arrest, however, Ronald Grimsley changed his story again. He now told Inspector Stainwobble that he'd lied about the involvement of the other men, and that he alone had been responsible for Tanya's murder. In this new story, he said that he'd fetched Tanya from the club, after having smoked several heroin cigarettes, and having consumed a large amount of alcohol. She'd asked him to take her home, but instead he went to his parents' house, as he wanted to have something to eat to help absorb the alcohol he'd drunk. Grimsley said that while they were at his parents' house, he tried to kiss Tanya, and she'd initially kissed him back, but then asked him to stop and just take her home. He says that, without having had anything to eat, they then got into his Opal Cadet, and he started off in the direction of Tanya's house. He said that he wanted to apologise to Tanya for kissing her earlier, and had pulled over to do so. He then lit another heroin cigarette, and when Tanya had realised that it was drugs he was smoking, she'd become enraged and started screaming at him. Grimsley claimed that he'd blacked out, and the next thing he remembered was finding himself on top of a half-naked Tanya, with his hands around her neck. When he realised that she was dead, 
He'd driven around until he found a place to dump her body. Then he'd driven a bit further and dumped her jacket. He kept her cell phone, which he put his own SIM card into. The version simply did not fit the evidence. Several experts testified that there was no way that the blunt force injuries that Tanya had received could have been done in a space as small as the inside of an Opal Cadet. Experts on the effects of heroin also said that it was almost impossible for a person who had consumed as much heroin as Grimsley claimed he had that night to have been aware enough and have enough strength to beat and rape Tanya so severely and then undertake the type of cover-up acts he carried out within minutes of the alleged blackout. In fact, experts said that it's highly unusual to black out from heroin use at all, and if he had blacked out, it was likely from the alcohol. But even that scenario made no sense because he had detailed memories of what had happened both before and after the alleged blackout. Studies on people who suffer blackouts from alcohol show that their memories of events around the blackout are hazy at best. Grimsley claimed that he had heard about snuff films in an article he'd read in the U magazine, and he decided to come up with that story to get himself less jail time. He also claimed that he wanted to commit suicide so that he didn't have to face what he had done, and not because he was afraid of the drug dealers. Ronald Grimsley was charged with murder, robbery, rape, and indecent assault. The indecent assault charge stemmed from the anal rape, which was evident. In 2003, Forced anal penetration was considered indecent assault and not rape. Thankfully, today, our definition of rape has been updated to include all forms of forced sexual penetration. Grimsley, despite his confession, pleaded not guilty to all charges on the basis that he'd been so intoxicated with heroin and alcohol that he hadn't been in control of his actions. After the judge heard the expert testimony, which refuted the blackout claim, he sent Grimsley for two psychiatric evaluations so that he could be certain that the loss of conscious action that Grimsley claimed to have experienced was not caused by mental illness. Both reports returned the same findings. Ronald Grimsley did not suffer from any psychiatric disorder which would result in him having killed Tanya while in a dissociated state. The trial was undoubtedly a horrific experience for Bob and Dolores Flowerday, who had to listen to the sickening details of their daughter's terrifying final moments. At one point when Ronald had testified that he was terribly sorry for what he'd done, the Flowerdays shouted at him in unison, It's too late. On another occasion, Dolores had broken down and begged Grimsley to just die. Thankfully, despite lingering suspicions that they still did not have the full story, Ronald Grimsley was found guilty on all charges. The judge dismissed his defense that he'd been unaware of his actions and said that he clearly intentionally killed Tanya after she refused his sexual advances. Grimsley was sentenced to 25 years for the murder charge and a total of 18 years for the three other charges, which would be served concurrently with a murder sentence. He was not given the option of applying for parole and would be forced to serve his entire sentence. His earliest point of release should have been 2030. I say should have been, because when I was researching this case, I came across a petition that one of Tanya's friends had put together in February this year. The petition was to oppose the release of Ronald Grimsley. Despite him having been denied the opportunity to ever apply for parole, a change in the law has given Ronald a loophole. 
It's the same change in the law that saw the president granting the release of several offenders at the end of last year, including Flippy Fenter, who'd been serving time for killing three children. Tanya's friend had refused to take this lying down and managed to gather almost 4,000 signatures opposing Grimley's release. I was unable to find any mention of this possibility of parole in the media, but I did send Tanya's friend a message to ask whether he had in fact been released. As at the recording of this episode, though, I don't have that information. Also during my research, I came across a message board discussing the snuff film aspect of this case. A woman calling herself Carla said that she'd known Ronald Grimsley for eight years before he committed this crime. She said that people who really knew Ronald were not surprised he had done such an atrocious thing. She said that with his own personality traits, combined with his sustained hard drug use, he'd been a ticking time bomb. She went on to say that she didn't believe the snuff film ever existed, and that Grimsley alone was responsible for Tanya's death. Photographs also emerged after the trial of Ronald Grimsley enjoying a meal and a beer with his family and friends in a restaurant just hours after having killed Tanya Flowerday. The investigating officer who'd been responsible for solving Tanya's case went on to have some dark times of her own. Soon after the trial, Christelle Steinwebel had charges laid against her for corruption. She was also suspended from the police force. The informant who'd given the information to Steinwebel had claimed that she'd short paid him. It was alleged that she'd been given 12,000 rand to pay him, and he claimed he'd only received 1,800. The charges against Steinwebel were dropped, but she resigned from the police department soon after. Now, I have no idea whether any of these allegations were even true. I would think that if they were, the charges wouldn't have been dropped. Steinwebel's resignation is also not an admission of anything. Her working environment could simply have become too difficult to deal with. Whether or not she indeed did what she is accused of, the fact remains that if it wasn't for Inspector Christelle Steinwebel's willingness to take this case on, there is a good possibility that the link to Grimsley may never have been made. One of the things that was never determined, though, is how Tanya's ID book landed up in her parents' postbox. No mention was ever made again of this. In my opinion, there's a good chance that it wasn't put there by anyone related to her disappearance or death. In South Africa, our ID books often have little pieces of paper printed with our physical address at the back. I think there's a very good chance that someone found the ID book and decided to return it to its owner. We don't know where Ronald disposed of the ID book originally, though. There's a good chance that it was in the pockets of Tanya's jacket and either dropped out or someone found the jacket and took the ID out. It would be interesting to know where that ID was found, though, because it might add credence to one or the other version of Grimsley's story. Because there's still questions. While no video was ever found, the house that Ronald spoke about in Fontainebleau did exist, and it was a drug haven. The place that Tanya was dumped at, though, is closer to Julian's Bistro than this drug house, and one would think that anyone having killed a young girl would want to spend as little time as possible driving around with her body in their car. If she had been killed at the drug house, I would expect to see her body in that area, not almost 10 kilometers away. This lends more credence, in my mind, to Grimsley's second story, that he had been en route to Tanya's house and pulled over. One thing that would be able to clear this up for us is physical evidence. Unfortunately, 
I was unable to find court documents for this case, so I don't know the details of the physical evidence they had. But if Tanya was really killed in Grimsley's car, with the violence that was inflicted on her, there would have been traces of her blood. Similarly, if she'd been killed in the drug house, there would have been evidence there. It's quite frustrating to me that we don't have this information to put a rest to this, but I'll carry on digging, and if I do come across clarification, I'll do a follow-up episode. The possibility remains that Ronald Grimsley was threatened in order to change his story. Although, if this was the case, rather than leaving him around to tell the tale, would these people not just have taken him out? It would likely not have been that difficult to achieve in a prison environment. Maybe these people saw that the investigation had moved on, and that the possibility of a snuff tape had all but been discounted. Maybe they thought, why rock the boat? He claimed he'd read about snuff films in a magazine article, but we can't dismiss the fact that he worked for a television production company, and he would have had the skills required to put together such a movie. I don't think there's any doubt that Ronald Grimsley was responsible for the death of Tanya Flowerday. Opinions are split as to whether he was the only one involved, though. Seventeen years after her death, sadly, there seems to be very little chance that we'll ever know the truth. A year after Tanya's death, Bob Flowerday said, quote, Anyone who says it gets better with time to accept your child's death doesn't know what they're talking about. It doesn't get better. It only gets worse. You just learn to hide your emotions better. End quote. Tanya Flowerday was just 18 years old. She was a level-headed, hard-working young woman who deserved so much more than what she got. She was just having some good clean fun with her friends, but one phone call to the wrong person changed all of that. Seventeen years later, her friends and family still commemorate her memory. Her mother counts down every single birthday that never was, and posts beautiful photographs of the child she never got a chance to see become an adult. Her friends are still so invested in Tanya's memory that they will fight to keep her killer behind bars, and I truly hope that he is indeed still there. Either way, by 2030, Ronald Grimsley will be back on the streets, living his life and moving on from the legacy of pain he's left in his wake. Thank you for listening to episode 23, The Murder of Tanya Flowerday. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to subscribe to the show on the app you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I'll be back next Friday with a mini-sode. Until then, please stay safe and healthy. I appreciate all of your support and I'll chat to you soon.